Josh Blackman. Hello. Um, he is going to give you a mock class to give you an idea of what you're going to experience beginning on Monday. And Monday. So it begins. Monday. Yes. <laughs> all right, welcome. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. I see many smiling faces. Can we start? Can we start? Okay. I see. I see many smiling faces. I'm glad you're all here. Um, the number of rules is to be on time, and that means being in time when class starts, not a couple minutes after. Uh, and be ready when class starts. Um, law school is going to be something different than what you've experienced before. Um, you all come here from undergraduate. You had good grades. You did well. You were probably at the top of your class, or maybe close to it. Uh, you're not anymore. You're surrounded by a lot of really smart people who are all at the top of your class. And by virtue of competition, you're going to have to work harder. You're going to have to try harder. And I understand you all gave the dean this uh, contract, this commitment with these 10 commitments. I want to repeat them. I think they're, they're helpful. Uh, you'll get involved. You'll challenge yourself. You'll not take shortcuts. Maintain balance and perspective. Ask for help. Be professional. Maintain your integrity, always. Respect others, always. Enjoy yourself. This can be fun. But the most important one is number 10 is do the work. Um, if you don't do the work, you'll be left behind. Um, I don't want to sound too mean, but it becomes very obvious in class by the second or third class if you're not keeping up with your readings. Um, it becomes very obvious because when you call on someone, they're not prepared. Now let me give you a brief introduction of how law school class works. Every professor will be different. Um, some professors will call on a single student and ask them questions nonstop for an entire hour. You're laughing. This will happen to you. Some of your professors may call on maybe four or five people in class and ask them a number of questions. Uh, my strategy, what I do, is I go up and down the rows. I'll start with you and go you, 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 and everyone gets one question. Um, the number one rule is you have to know what your professor wants because everyone's different. And I wouldn't be great if everyone did the same thing. No, that's not what you're going to get. And the best way to make a good impression is to be prepared. Let me state that a little bit differently. The easiest way to make a bad impression is to be unprepared. Um, it's very obvious if you haven't done the reading. We know very quickly. We've done this before. The readings are heavy. In each class, you have what? Maybe 25, 30 pages of reading for every day. And you have what? Four classes plus writing. So you're having maybe 100 to 200 pages of reading a week, depending on your week. Um, it's daunting. There are only so many hours in the day. And reading a page of a law school case book is not like reading a page of like a Harry Potter novel, right? It, it's not, it's, yeah, you're, you're shaking your head. No. It's not easy to understand. It's written in a language that seems very old, very out of date. There are going to be words that you just don't know what they mean. There are going to be words in Latin that aren't even in English. My reading for today, right? Um, and the answer is you have to find a way to deal with it. You have to build a schedule, uh, a framework that will allow you to actually complete all of your readings on time. Now, one of the tips, I think it was Dean uh, Barry's number third tip, is don't take shortcuts. I mean that profoundly. There are lots of shortcuts law students can take. For example, you might have a friend who's a little bit older and has taken my class or someone else's class before. And say, hey, I'll give you my notes. I'll give you my, uh, uh, my outline. Don't touch it. First off, you don't know if their outline's any good, right? <laughs> a bad outline can do so much damage to you because you're reading the wrong thing. In fact, a bad outline can do you more damage than not reading at all because you, you learn wrong, right? Second, using someone else's outline doesn't help you. The reason why taking notes is important is because it helps you think things through. Um, simply reading from a you know, case book you know, this thick, uh, you don't learn anything. Um, you're not going to learn anything, just reading it. You have to write and take notes. Because when your professor calls on you in class, you don't get a minute to reread the case. It's what's in your notes. Um, so you need to learn uh, 
quickly. You have a class on Monday. How to effectively take notes? And I'm sorry, you won't find the right answer to that question for some time. It will take you trial and error, right? You're gonna have to try different things and see what works. Maybe you try, um, uh, uh, people use different colored highlighters. Uh, people uh, 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 try to uh, uh, separate their notes with the facts and the issues and the rules, right? There, there are a hundred ways of taking notes and I won't pretend to tell you which way is the best because I don't know which works for you. But you have to figure out how to take notes well when you're reading. In fact, did you all get the assignment? You all got it? Did you all read it? I don't believe you. I know there's only a couple people who didn't. Every year, there's someone who doesn't. Last year, actually, I called him and he wasn't prepared. And he, he pretended, he started making some facts, but something out of Fox, he's like, yeah, he caught the Fox, and no, he, he didn't. So <laughs> I, know, I know very quickly, last year I actually got someone in that. Um, the second thing you have to figure out is what to do during class. Now, a number of you are actually writing what I'm saying, which I'm actually kind of relieved, but not entirely. Um, when you're in class, there's this urge to this, to type every word your professor says. Um, resist that urge, because when you are typing with all speed, you're not listening. You're, you're simply dumping, right? You're, you're not processing what you're thinking. Uh, some of my colleagues ban laptops altogether. You'll find that out very quickly. I don't. I, I, I don't have a position on that. I don't frankly care what you do. Um, so it's your choice. But some colleagues ban laptops, which means you're writing pen notes. Um, some of my colleagues let you record. All my lectures are on YouTube, actually. That's what that camera's right there is for, right? Uh, all my lectures are online, so if you have a professor who records, then maybe go back after class and fill in your gaps in your notes, right? There are lots of ways of following along in class, but if you simply write down everything the professor says, you're going to miss stuff. Um, another piece of advice, and this sounds very obvious, but it shouldn't be, is uh, get to know us. Every year, I teach property, which is a second semester class. So I won't have, you won't have me this semester, I promise. Maybe in the spring you'll have me. Uh, uh, but, or at least, I'm sorry, your second semester, because your spring starts. You might have me in your second semester. But every semester, at the end of the term, I have a student come to my office and say, I'd like a letter of recommendation. And I have no idea who the student is. They were in my class, they never raised their hand, they never came to my office. I have nothing to say about the student but their grade. Um, it, it makes me, uh, I, those are not very good letters you could imagine. But take advantage. That's number five. Seek help. Um, you're not going to know all the answers. And all the professors have office hours. We have a little sign on our door. Come by those times. If for whatever reason you can't come by that time, whatever reason, uh, email us. We're usually pretty good at finding other times to meet. Um, but take advantage of that opportunity. Come by and talk to us. And even if you don't really have a question, you know, say introduce yourself. Say, hey, I'm Joe. I'm Sally. You know, to college here. You know, I'm interested in this area of the law. What, you know, what, what advice do you have? And I, I love those conversations. And, and I remember those people. I remember the students who actually come by and talk to me. Uh, if the first time I see you is to complain about your final exam score, which, which happens, there are people who I've never seen them until they get their exam score. They're unhappy with it. Um, I, I can't help you. All right. So my advice: do the readings. Don't take shortcuts. Don't Get your outline from your friend. Don't buy commercial outlines in the bookstore or Amazon or wherever else. They're going to lead you astray. All right? They're, 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 such, they're so attractive. It's like, oh my god, someone wrote a book that summarizes all the cases in this little, little paper thing. By the way, don't bring them to class. If you, want, if you want to get in trouble, you're laughing. I promise you, one of you will be caught in class with those. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, it will happen. It's just laws of numbers. And professors know what those look like. They're these little thin paper books. I know exactly what they look like, right? Uh, I've, you know, do the readings, don't take the shortcuts, don't use the outlines. Uh, in class, try to take meaningful notes. Um, go visit your professors. Um, and my last piece of advice before I start the class is um, get to know your colleagues. Uh, the people sitting to your left and your right will be your classmates for another three years or so. And after that, they're going to be your law firm associates. They might be your opposing counsel. Maybe there's someone you want to refer a case to. Maybe they refer you some business, right? Um, the Houston and Texas legal community is pretty small. I mean, it's, it's huge. But you will be shocked at how often you're in some sort of legal case, like, oh, yeah, he was in my torts class. Oh, yeah, she was in my property course. I remember her, right? Even now, I've been teaching here. It's my eighth year. 
I see my own students out and about. They're now making partner, right? They're, they're moving up the ranks. They're, 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 they're doing stuff. And, and then I know people, so, oh, I know she does this kind of law, go, go call her, right? Oh, he does that, go call him. Um, get to know your friends, right? You know, you all know each other for three days now, two days now. Um, you'll get to know each other very well. Um, some people like study groups, some don't. I don't have a, I don't have a strong preference. It's really, it's really your, your, your pick. But get to know your friends. Um, maybe for whatever reason you can't go to class one day and you want to borrow someone's notes. You're sick. That's helpful. Uh, maybe before the final exam you want to take a practice exam and grade each other and, and say do. That's helpful, right? You know, may, maybe you're working on some sort of uh, moot court competition. You want to pick a partner. You get to do that later. Not right away, but eventually you can pick partners. Oh, I want to work with him. I want to work with her, right? You got to get to know your, your classmates and your friends. Um, this is going to be, I think, the key uh, uh, to your success. Um, but always, if you need help, um, ask for it. Uh, law school can be stressful. I don't want to minimize it at all. Uh, I'm asking a lot of you. There are only 24 hours in the day. Um, you need to sleep. Uh, you need to eat. Uh, you need to drink. No, don't drink. Please be careful of the alcohol. There's a strong temptation. Law students have a significant rate of substance abuse. It's unhealthy. These are trends that continue into legal practice. It's one of the highest rates of uh, substance abuse. So please be careful about that. I know it's tempting, but just take care of yourselves. Uh, uh, you can't forget about your family. Um, I know it's tempting. Mom, I can't come for Thanksgiving. I have to study. It happens every year, but just keep what matters to you most uh, because this is a this is a wild ride. I describe it as a marathon, a three-year-long marathon that you run at a sprint pace because um, there's not much time to stop. But you need to always remember what's important to you why you came here in the first place. Okay, any questions from you? And if, you, if you have a question for me and you want to come to my office after, I'll be there. I think you have lunch break, but I'll be in my office 623. Come by, talk to me. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them as well. Um, and don't be shy, uh, uh, because I'm not grading you for at least six months to a year. Uh, so I, I won't remember. Well, I shouldn't say that. I might remember you. I, I remember the kid who may have been answered to a question. Him I remembered. Uh, but, but generally, um, I like to do this guy. I will not have you in a few weeks. So uh, if you have a question, you can always come by and email me as well. All right? Yeah, we're, we're here for you. I mean, I know what I'm saying is, is, is intimidating. It's daunting. But uh, you're not the first people to go through this, right? There have been lots of students who've sat exactly where you're sitting before, and they survived. They are now out in the wild working as attorneys and doing things that are very important. OK, so let's start. Um, the case that we assign for you is um, a classic, a classic case. It's a case that I think every law student reads at every law school in the country. Um, and I think you will read it uh, when you take property, I guess, in the fall, because uh, that's your second semester, because you guys are starting in the spring. Um, it's a famous case for a couple reasons. One, the facts are pretty straightforward, right? You're going to read some cases that involve some very complicated factual patterns. This is, I think, pretty easy. I mean, it's not, I would say, easy. I shouldn't should be respectful. But it, as far as cases would go, it's straightforward. Um, also, I, I give this case for the orientation every year uh, because it's written in a language that might not be what you're used to reading. It was written in the early 1800s. There's some Latin in there. Hopefully you look it up, at least Google, right? Um, and there are phrases that, like, what the hell is that, right? Um, but also, the reason why I give it is because there is a dispute between a majority opinion and dissenting opinion on, a, on an issue of law. And what you'll find law school is about, at least your first semester or two, is absorbing these, these sorts of old decisions. Right? In other words, we don't really care about fox hunts anymore. That's, that's, we don't care. That's, that's not important. right? But believe it or not, the same rules that we use to discuss who can hunt a fox and who catches a fox are applied to who can capture an oil well. Yeah. The exact same rules that are discussed in this Fox case are used in problems that involve massive natural resource deposits. Believe it or not, it's true. So don't say, oh, this is stupid. This is just Fox. I don't care about Foxes, right? What you're learning here gives you um, like building blocks. Think of like when you're a little kid, right? You build the blocks, right? This is the first row. 
And the building blocks help you get to the more complicated stuff that actually, God willing, people hire you one day to, 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 to help you with advice. OK? All right. So I'm just going to start here. You're in the unlucky seat. I'm sorry. Um, uh, and by the way, what's your name? Jessica. Jessica. And I'm Josh. You can call me Josh. I don't like <coughs> I'm the outlier. You can call me Josh, but other professors profess for last name. Uh, not Mr. and Miss. That, that can get sometimes touchy. The professor, not Mr. and Miss. I, 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 I don't care. You can call me whatever you want. It just doesn't matter to me. But, but, but just be very careful. Dean. Dean. Dean's a good name. Right for the dean. Not Mr. and Mrs. Dean. Uh, 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 professor is good. Um, but just, just <coughs> no, no, you have to, there's a language of law school that doesn't always make sense. <coughs> and it might not be what you guys are used to. But you have to learn it. And if you make the mistake once, you'll never make it again. It's like, I am not Mr. Right, anyway, so uh, Jessica, was it? Jessica. All right, Jessica, let's start off with Pearson v. Post. Uh, so start off and give us the facts of this case. By the way, this is almost certainly the first question you're going to get on Monday. For whatever class, what's your first class? Legal OK, second class. <laughs> <laughs> Contract. 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 Your, first, your first question would be, what are the facts in whatever case it is, right? So anyway, Jessica, do you want to give me the facts, please, in Pearson v. Post? So Pearson was chasing and pursuing an animal to fall. Good. And Post, after a while, decided that he, I guess he, I think he saw Pearson was chasing it, or at least he knew that he was pursuing it. Which one was the hunter? Pearson or Post? Post. OK, Post, was, Post was the hunter, right? Yes. And he was chasing the fox, OK? What did Pearson do? I think you got it backwards. I said it was the other way. <laughs> um, yes, okay. <laughs> no, then, no, not yes, okay. Uh, then Post was um, the hunter, and Pearson decided to kill the fox, even though he knew that Post was chasing it. Okay, I think you see what you did there, right? So she figured out what was going on. I, I, I knew she had a bet, right? Yeah. Okay, so we have a case here, right? This is going to sound really stupid, but one of the hardest things in any case to know is who is who. Trust me on this. Trust me on this. Because very often the case will say the defendant or the appellant or the appellee, right? They won't say who is who. And I think and I don't need to pick on you. I think you, you gave me the facts correct. I think you just flipped the you flipped the roles. Um, you need to know who is who. And I'll need a trick that you'll keep with you for the rest of your life. Okay? The case is called Pearson versus Post, right? Pearson versus Post. And we're in the New York Supreme Court, which is their their, their highest court. <coughs> Why does Pearson come first and Post come second? Oh, yes. What's your name? Chelsea. Chelsea. Tell me why. He appealed the case, and when he appealed, he became the appellant. And Very good. Before. The name that comes first is a person who's appealing. Let me say that differently. The name that comes first is a person who lost in the lower court. Because the reason why you appeal is because you lost, right? If you win, you're good, right? You're happy. But, but, but uh, Chelsea, is that right? Chelsea's exactly right. Pearson's going first, right? And Pearson's appealing. And so, uh, ma'am, what's your name? Uh, the, 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 the? Uh, Devin. Oops, sorry? Devin. Devin. Why was Pearson appealing this case? <laughs> what did the lower court rule then? Um, in favor of Chelsea. And what did the lower court hold? They held that um, it was his property. Who's his? It was Post. Why was it Post property? Okay, let's take a step back. You got most of your answers, right? But just one at a time. I see in the back. I appreciate the hand. So let's just take a step back, right? You have a fox hunt. Post is the hunter, right? He is trying to capture this fox. And has anyone ever done a, done a fox hunt? No, usually not. Okay. Yes? I was deer hunting. The only time I've ever been deer hunting in my life, I'll never go again. Um, and we saw a fox. Okay, close enough. Right? We, we, we shoot that because it was going to scare the deer away. Oh, okay, got it. Well, anyway, so you have Post who's going on this elaborate fox hunt, right? And then all of a sudden, Pearson shows up, and he comes and kills the fox, and he grabs him. So imagine, right? You're spending all this time to try and hunt the fox, to corner him into a place that's you know secluded, and then this jerk comes in, Pearson, and swipes away the fox, <coughs> right? So. Go ahead. I just want to answer that. Go, please, please, please continue. <laughs> so they ruled in favor of Post because he was in pursuit 
And just wait, who, who's they? And I don't mean to pick on you, but uh, just let me let me make a broader point. We say he, she, they, it. Pronouns are bad for law because they're not precise. So when you mean, so who's they in this case? The court. Which court? The, the I don't whisper. I, hear, I can hear. I have very good hearing. Well, it's the I have very good hearing. Supreme Court also upheld. Okay, so when I say, you said they, which court are we talking about? Ruled for post. Okay, so let's try this again, uh, Chelsea. Right. So what happened in the trial court? The trial court ruled in favor of post based on property law. So well, who is post? Post was originally the plaintiff. Did post actually capture the fox? No. And the trial court ruled for him. Yes, saying that he was in pursuit. Okay. Okay. And then so who appealed? Pearson. Okay. Now we're in business. Okay. So we understand what, what, what Chelsea just said, right? The trial court, the lower court, gave a ruling for the hunter post. At that point, Pearson appealed. And Pearson appealed said, hey, wait a minute. I got the fox. It's mine. Okay. Then, ma'am, what's your name? Tori. Tori. Does the Supreme Court of New York affirm or reverse the lower court? They reverse the lower court saying that um, capturing is possession of the animal. Okay, okay, now we're in business. Okay, very good. Okay? So everyone sees what happened. What we just described, we took about three or four people, is what's called the posture of the case. You know that phrase, the posture of the case? Think of like posture, like, in like a standing up straight, right? Your posture. Posture describes the history of the case, what you might call the procedural history, or you might see as procedural posture. You'll see these phrases, and different professors use different phrases because it drives you nuts, right? It would be nice to use the same phrase, but they don't. So procedural history or procedural posture of the case. Okay, you with me so far? Okay. So Pearson loses in the lower court because they awarded it to the hunter. At that point, Pearson, the jerk, Right? He appeals to the Supreme Court of the state. Okay. Um, and the legal question, the facts aren't really in dispute. Right? The, the facts are, are more or less agreed upon by the parties. By the way, uh, uh, so, uh, what's your name, man? Heaven. Heaven? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. How do we know that Post was actually hunting the fox for a very long time? Um, he describes it, um, and I, I remember he said that they kind of made eye contact. But do, how do we actually know? Uh, we don't go on his word and what Pearson said. How do we know Post is telling the truth? Hmm. Do you see anything problematic where if, if, if Post argues that he should get it because he put all this energy into the hunt, what if he's lying? What if he just showed up five minutes before and, and Pearson came up five minutes later? Do you think his case looks a little bit different? You say no. Why? What's your name, sir? Zach. Zach. And just, uh, yeah. But I'm giving you advice. If you want to open your mouth, put your hand up. And if you're not cold on, keep your mouth closed. I know this sounds like, like, like kindergarten stuff, but the quickest way to piss off a law professor is to speak out of turn. Actually, the number quickest way is to be late to class. That is just like a, a no-no. Do you have 9 a.m. classes this semester? My, boy, my, my, my friends, get here at 8. Houston, uh, you might, maybe you're from Houston, maybe you're not. 9 a.m. means you get here at 8, right? When I have a, when I have a 9 a.m. class, I do get here around 7.30, just in case of some weird 90-minute detour on the highway, right? Wherever you're coming from, some of you may have long commutes, some of you maybe live, you know, walking distance. If you're in walking distance, fine. But if you have to drive, don't be late. The quickest way I remember a student is if they're late to class because everyone's in there seated, they're taking notes, whatever, and then someone just, you know, they come in, they're all, they're all exasperated, they, they put their book down, they, make, it, you know, they have to walk behind six people to get to the middle of the aisle, and you know, excuse me, excuse me, excuse, you know, and they have to put their books down, it, it, it just, it's a commotion. Um, and my policy, which is, is not popular, is if you're late, you're absent. Uh, if you're not electronic, um, uh, you know, the, the clicker, right, the electronic app on your phone to take attendance, it's very easy, but I turn it off when the class starts. If you're not here, you're not here. Um, you have five absences, and those can add up quickly. So, so don't be late and, and raise your hands. That, 
If you do that, you'll be halfway to the passing, right? Anyway, so uh, Robert, was it? Zach. I'm sorry, Zach. Robert's my dad's name. Oh, well, I didn't know that, but that, that's, okay. So Zach, so you, why do you think that um, if he only spent five minutes hunting, the facts would be the same? Because for the appellate level, this is not concerned with determining the facts of the case. Oh, forget, 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 forget that for a minute. Forget, forget that for a minute, right? Let's just assume we're back in the trial court, right? Let's let, let's just say um, one second, man. Let's just say that um, post comes in here and says I was hunting the fox for five hours, and then we get some evidence showing that he was only going for five minutes. He perjured himself. He lost. Well, Hadron was telling the truth. The fact that one person says A and person B says something else doesn't mean that one's lying. But you just said, what if he says five and then we find out? No, someone else says it. There's no recording. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so, no shame? Taylor. Taylor, what do you think? I was going to say, um, as far as the trial court goes, they're going by like they consider the common law at the time. And as far as they're concerned, it's whoever starts first. Mm -hmm. So may it be five minutes before the next guy comes in or five hours before. It doesn't matter if it's five minutes or five hours. As long as he is in pursuit first. It could be a minute before. So he's the one <coughs> All right, so let me let me ask a question. Uh, Ma'am, what's your name right there? Allie. Yeah, oh, so, yeah. <laughs> the last that. No, you have a question? No. Okay. okay. Yeah, Allie, let me ask you a question, Allie. Why? So there are two rules, right? There are two possible rules we can adopt. What are the two rules that the majority and the dissent are fighting over? What are the two rules that, that are at issue? Whether um, pursuit defines like actual possession, like they get the animal. Or? Or you have to actually kill, like shoot to kill, or like, injuring doesn't count as possession. Of what do you actually have to do to under the second approach? Mortally. What does that require? <laughs> Is chasing it enough? And to mortally wound an animal, what must you do? What has to happen? He has to die. Well, well yeah, he dies, right? But, but <laughs> how do you kill an animal? What do you actually have to do to kill the animal? Shoot it. And what, what does that shooting do? What's the key step there? <coughs> no, don't, don't, don't. I, I hear everything. And so what's your name? Matt. Matt, what's the key step? It's not just that the animal dies. What has to happen? You have to get the animal, you have to capture the animal. Yes, capture, okay, thank you, that's what I'm looking for, okay? So there are two rules here, right? The two rules that the majority and dissent disagree over. Um, the first one, Matt just gave me a minute ago, is called the rule of capture. The rule of capture. Um, the rule of capture can be stated pretty simply. The first person to capture the animal owns it, right? Now, what does it mean to capture? Does it mean to actually grab it with your bare hands? Does it mean to shoot it with a rifle, maybe a bow and arrow? Um, does it mean to maybe throw a net over it to, 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 to actually stop it from running around? There are different ways to perhaps to capture it. The other rule is what you might call labor theory. I think Taylor said it for us a minute ago. Um, labor theory. It is if you expend some amount of energy into capturing something, you should be rewarded for that effort. Even if you don't catch it, your labor gives you some entitlement to the animal. All right, so these are our two theories, right? You have the labor theory, and you have the capture theory. So what's your name? Grant. Grant, Grant which theory does the majority adopt? I don't know. You gonna do the reading? Why not? What's your name, sir? Kevin. Kevin. Which theory does the majority adopt and which one does the dissent adopt? The majority goes with the rule of capture. Good. And the dissenting goes with uh, labor. Okay, very good. So we have two opinions, right? We have the majority opinion <laughs> by Judge Tompkins. And we have the dissenting opinion by Judge Livingston. Okay. Now, you read the majority, and that seems, well, that seems persuasive, right? And then you read the dissent, it's like, oh, that seems persuasive also, right? Uh, and so what's your name? Austin. Austin. Let me ask you a question, Austin. How would 
a judge sitting in New York in 18, was 1805, how would a judge sitting in New York in 1805 decide whether to go with the rule of capture or the rule of labor theory? How's the judge to decide? Okay, well, in this situation, were there any previous cases that were helpful to the court? Did the, the court discuss any cases? Well, so let me ask you a follow-up. The year is 1805 in New York, right? What generally was the sort of legal landscape in New York in the early 1800s? It just, you don't have to know much about American history, maybe a little bit will help. What had happened recently? Yeah, what's your name? Jenny. Jenny. What what was going on in the early 1800s in New York and the United States more broadly? What did War with England, like England, anti-England sentiment kind of getting away from English. Oh, very good. So we had a war of independence, didn't we? 1776. We had a new constitution ratified in 1787. By the time you get to the 1800s, the states were not colonies anymore. And the states had abandoned English common law. Now, Jenny, does the court discuss some cases from England? It says that they're, they're not really relevant to New York. They're not, it, it addresses that there's stuff happening in England, but none of Very good. They're basically saying, not for us, right? So there's no common law case law for them to decide. And Jenny, just one more question. Are there any statutes that govern the hunting of foxes? Do they cite any statutes or any sort of written law? So. Okay, so here's the conflict, right? There's no common law, that is, there's no precedence. They're all in England, we don't do that stuff anymore. There is no statutes, right? There's no written law for them to have. Okay, ma'am, what's your name? Karen. Karen, okay, Karen, let me ask you a question, please. What's a judge to do if there's no common law precedent and there's no statutes? How is a judge to decide a case? The, the case is before them, these people disagree over who wins. How is a judge to decide a case in which there's no common law precedent and no statutory precedent? What's a judge to do? Usually just to make that judgment. I mean, do they just decide on what they feel is right? So well, what do they do here? What the majority in dissent didn't just say, <laughs> I think Poe should win because he's a nice guy. Or I think Pearson should lose because he's a jerk. Is that what is that what, is that what I made you read seven pages of that? I made you read a lot of stuff, didn't I? So what basis did the court rely on if there was no common law precedent or no statutes? I don't know exactly how that decision came right. about. You're, you're next, actually, so, so you're perfect. What's your name, sir? Trent. Trent, you tell me. Um, what did they rely on? The thoughts and writings of philosophers. And the thoughts and the writings of philosophers? Who? My goodness, can you do that? Can you go to your legal writing class and say, I'm going to cite philosophers? Can you do that today? today. No. <laughs> but Trent, I think you make a good point. Why do you think these judges in the 1800s cited these old thinkers and philosophers and writers? Isn't that what like, a lot of the law was at the time? Kind of very good, very good. Uh, here they went old school, right? They cited people who you probably have never, ever heard of before. I mean, how many of you ever heard of Pufendorf? It's like a Harry Potter house, right? <laughs> Grotius, anyone ever heard of Grotius? Barbarak, Bracton, Fleeta? You've never heard of these people, right? Um, who were these people? Uh, they were uh, legal commentators, some on Roman law, some from the Renaissance period, some from the Enlightenment period. Uh, who wrote on different elements of law. And one of the problems that these ancient writers had to consider was a common one. You have two people, claim, uh, two people who claim uh, ownership of an animal that was hunted. 
right? Some of these ancient writers favored the rule of capture, right? And under the rule of capture, what happens? You have to actually capture the animal, or maybe mortally wound it, or maybe trap it, right? Um, wait, what's your name? Alyssa. Alyssa, what's the test that the court gives to decide when an animal has actually been captured. But what if you just throw a net over them? It doesn't really injure them. Does a net amount to a capture? So what's the test? The court, the court says, look, you don't need to actually seize the body. Instead, you have to do this. Blank, fill in the blank. What's the rule? And, and by the way, when you have your, your outlines, like your rule statements, the holding, this is what I'm asking is like, what's the rule of the majority? What, at what point is there capture? What do you have to do? Uh, what do you have to do? Is this where you have to have it in view with knowledge? No, no, no. And sir, what's your name? Oh, Brandon. Brandon, what's I, the answer? I, I, I just got the reasons why that's what I say. Two. I've caught two. Okay. Uh, sir, what's the name right there? Eric, what's the rule? Is it uh, the steward must have unequivocal intention of appropriating the animal and strip it of its natural liberty? Bingo. That's it. You, and I actually said deprive. I stopped myself. Some of you may have heard it. You have to deprive the animal of their natural liberty. That's the exact right test. Now, uh, so what's your name again? I missed it. Uh, Eric. Eric, what does that mean to deprive an animal of their natural liberty? Life, but you don't have to actually kill it, though, and that's the important point. It's sufficient to trap them. But what do you think that phrase means, natural liberty? Uh, go on. You're already good. What's your name? Casey. Casey, what does it mean to deprive an animal of their natural liberty? I think that's good. I think that's a good answer, right? It's they can no longer go where they want to go. You've now. Um, all, one second. You've now altered their path, and they're either either trapped or perhaps wounded mortally, or even dead. Right. So you don't need to actually capture it. You have to deprive the animal of their natural liberty. Uh, uh, natural liberty. Seeing is not enough. Yeah. I think you answered my question, but I'm still going to ask it. Okay. You can deprive the animal of its natural liberty without killing it. Yes. So you've deprived it of its natural liberty, but you have not physically gained control of it, so have you captured it? Well, the, the rule of capture allows for something short of capture. Welcome to law school, right? <laughs> you can capture an animal without actually capturing it. Net. I think the net is a good example. Or, like I said, my, the, my two days of deer hunting experience, you shoot a deer from a half mile away, and it runs three miles and falls down. Right. And somebody else sees it fall down from somewhere else if and you, walk up to it. If you mortally it. wounded it under the rope capture, it's yours. Okay. That's what I, that's what I was. I was going to say, on that note, that's part of the reason that they have laws saying that you have to have like licenses to do these things and like you have to put tags on animals because taking that animal without a gun, without hunting license, is poaching. Are you a hunter? Yes. Well, let me ask you a question, Casey. I think I'll, you'll be on, on deck in a minute. Let me ask Casey a question. How would you resolve this dispute between Post and Pearson? I don't think it was fair for, now I've probably got their names mixed up again. I don't Just say Hunter and the Jerk and make, make your life easier. <laughs> that the shooter took the hunt from the actual person pursuing the animal, but I don't think because the other person hadn't trapped it or hadn't a shot it, that it was his kill. Mm. Any other hunters here want to opine? Yeah, ma'am, what's your name? Rose, what do you think? Um, I'm out of the loop here, but if you're an accomplice of hunting and you, um, Hunter A, if you're an accomplice of hunting to some coffee shop, wherever it is, okay. and person B sees that you're hunting that animal and you strip that, the fact that that person is probably spent, you don't know if it's 10 seconds, 10 hours all day, you should respect the fact that that person put in that effort and time and energy to mm. capture that animal and to give them a shot. And if you take a shot, you may then kill the animal. Oh, Chelsea? Everything you guys have said earlier, that 
Trek, this he just got there. So he doesn't know what's on the other side of that animal, what, where that animal's been trapped to the other side of that. Mm. Um, One second, let me ask a question then, right? Um, we all, I think we all agree the majority, I'm sorry, the dissenting opinion is more fair, right? The dissenting opinion rewards labor. It rewards the effort you put into the hunt. So the advantage of the dissenting opinion, you might say, is fairness. So what's your name? Raul. Raul, let me ask you a question. What's the advantage of the majority opinion? What, the majority sort of hints at this at the end, right? But what does the majority opinion accomplish? Well, I mean, forget Pearson and Post, they don't really matter very much, right? They're setting a rule for other conduct. <coughs> what's, the, what's the advantage of the majority opinion? What's the advantage of the majority opinion? The dissent <coughs> promotes fairness, to be sure. What's the advantage of the majority opinion? Well, let me ask you a question. I think I, I posed this earlier, the, this question. How do we know how much time was actually spent hunting? One minute, five minutes, an hour, 10 hours? Do we actually know? We don't, but we just know that I think it's called a reasonable prospect. What was that? Huh? Okay, let me ask you the question a different way. We don't have cameras back then, right? There's no, people aren't you know, putting on Facebook how much they're hunting for. Evidentiary issues were pretty tricky back then, weren't they? What's the benefit of the role of capture? Why is that something that courts might be attracted to? You're a trial judge in the 1800s. Why might you like the, the role of capture? I see all your hands. I'm waiting. Yeah, um, What's your name, sir? Uh, Tyler. Tyler, what, if you're a trial judge in the 1800s, why might you like the rule of capture? What, 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 how does that make your life easier? Uh, it just kind of does away with having to deal with the evidence and the evidence to the animals and things like that. So well, how would you describe it then? Uh, just kind of like what? How would you describe the, the rule of capture then? In terms of if you're a trial judge in the 1800s, what, what, what's the benefit it gives you? You told me it's just going to be a little bit more concise. Ah, that's what I'm looking for. Easier, simpler. <laughs> Thank you. Got it. Got it. So it's simpler. There is what you call certainty, right? There's no dispute. He got the fox, it's his. There's no complicated evidentiary issues they have to fight over. So think of it as like a scale, right? The dissent promotes fairness, right? You reward the hunter. But the majority is more practical. Is, Look, I don't know who's actually hunting. This guy could be a, 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 a liar. And he just showed up in five minutes and said, oh, that's my fox. It wasn't actually there. So the majority promotes certainty. And the court says at the end, he says, for the sake of certainty, preserving peace and order. And he discusses trying to limit litigation, right? You have all these lawsuits over who was first, who was hunting, etc. Um, you often see these judges of the common law pick a rule, not because they like Pearson or like Post, but because it promotes certain values. Does it promote certainty or does it promote fairness, right? Is this an easy rule to apply? Do people agree on what fair means, right? Fair is one of those law, it's my, it's my four letter word begins with an F, I hate that word, right? Because <laughs> what I think is fair, what you think is fair, what you think is fair is probably not the same thing. Then you have kids or younger siblings. That's not fair, right? It, the word fairness has no actual meaning, right? Uh, uh, I shouldn't say that, but it's something that people argue. So if, you, if you've ever had an exam, say, that's not fair, it's probably the wrong answer, right? That, th that means you have nothing else, right? When you can't argue the law, you argue fairness. And that's general, <laughs> it's true. Okay, but I just want to take a step back. Uh, Raul was just kind of thinking about it for a minute. You're very often have a law professor who will not let you get bailed out, right? I, I eventually sort of bailed out because we have only a few minutes left, but there are some professors who they'll let you sit there for 30 minutes if you don't know the answer. And what they'll do is they'll ask rule 115 follow-up questions to try to get him to the right answer. And I could have done that. It would take me a while, which I didn't have time for. Um, and sometimes I'll do that, but I think it's required. And now I'll think, why on earth would a professor do that? 
the idea is the answer should not be coming from my mouth, it has to come from yours. And you have to drag it out. And often the process of dragging it out helps you learn it much better. Uh, I remember once I was in law school, I think it was contracts, my 1L year, and I was on call and I was on the hot seat for I think maybe 45 minutes or so straight. And at a certain point, I'm like, ah, oh, screw this. I just gave a wrong answer, he would move on. But like, it's intense and you remember it and you never forget that stuff. Okay. So we have the majority, which says you have to deprive of natural liberty. And the dissent says you reward the labor. Now, the dissent, I don't think, actually cares about labor theory, right? How would, uh, I'm sorry, sir, what's your name? Y yes, you. Yeah. Hey, Seuss, let me ask you a question, please. The, do you think the dissent really cares about labor theory and actually wants to decide this based on what Barbara Ack thinks? Um, do you not think really, no. Because you said that capital would be easier to change. No, no, but, but what does the dissent actually think sh should be resolved in this case? How, should the, how would the dissent actually handle this case? By, by turning to old ancient writers? Just the same way they did. Uh, no, you're not getting it. How, what 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 would the dissent actually do? How how do you think these disputes be resolved by, by a bunch of judges? See, the follow-up question is a little precise, right? Every question you ask gets a little more precise. Hopefully, getting to the right place. Do you think judges be deciding this dispute? I'm sure, well, in, in this case, since it's the dissent, wasn't the um, yeah from the original trial? Wasn't that the forget judges, right? Who does he think should be resolving disputes between hunters? It's even more precise question. Yes, sportsmen, right? See, I asked like four questions, you got more precise. Who should decide? Should judges decide? Who should decide dispute between hunters, right? You see, every question is more narrowly focused. That's how, that's how this goes. Um, he thinks that hunters should decide. Let the sportsmen arbitrate this, right? Don't, don't give this to judges. What the hell do judges know? Right, they're not, they're, not in the, they're, not, they're not shooting animals. They don't know this stuff, right? So the dissent goes with the rule of labor theory, but he's not really committed. He's very sarcastic. He's like, who are these, these, um, you know, these, these, these hunt these, these foxes? By the way, did anyone look up the Latin phrases? There's some great ones in here. Did anyone look up? Yes, uh, Taylor? I looked up a couple. I don't know if you want to add. <laughs> well, give me one that you liked. Um, I like the um, Hestum Gener Generous, yeah. My Latin's terrible. But and we of mankind. Yeah. This is a phrase used to describe pirates, right? <laughs> You're laughing. Piracy was a huge deal in the 1800s. It was like one of the, it's one of the biggest, it still is, yeah, but it was one of the biggest problems that plagued the Americas, the, the issue of piracy. Hostum humani generis, enemy, enemy of humankind. And that's how he described the fox. It's like this enemy of humankind that has to be destroyed, has to be eradicated, right? Um, uh, 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 De mortuus nil nisi bonum, concerning the dead, nothing but good should be said, right? So these little Latin phrases, but the dissent was basically being a, a jackass, right? He was being sarcastic. He didn't actually care about this case, but he had to write something. By the way, Justice Livingston would go on to serve in the U.S. Supreme Court. So he had a, 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 a big career ahead of him. Justice Tompkins became Vice President of the United States. So these two guys actually had pretty you know, big careers after they served on this court. Okay. All right, so we have the rule of capture, and we have the rule of labor theory. Now someone's going to ask, Josh, what's the rule today? The answer is both, right? To this day, Judges continue to argue about the rules of capture and rules of labor theory. And elements of both those tests um, uh, are incorporated into cases that you'll read for the rest of the year. Okay. Questions on the case? Yes? You said that one of the benefits of the rule of capture is that it makes things easier to understand, mm -hmm. easier to decide. But does it really, because how long do you have to deprive something of its natural liberty for it to be your possession? For example, lots of hunting, especially in New York in the early 1800s. Guys, don't pack up yet, by the way. We, the, and that's another pet peeve, when people pack up before the class is over. So don't do that. Yeah, he's asking a question, let him finish. Um, Go ahead. Lots of hunting, especially in New York in the early 1800s, was done through metal trapping. So if you trap the deer's foot, but the deer runs off with the trap on it, you haven't necessarily deprived of its natural liberty, but you have gained possession of it because your traps are marked and so on and so forth. But you haven't deprived of its natural liberty, mm -hmm. but you have taken possession of it. How long do you have to deprive it of its natural liberty 
Look, these are here. these are not bright line rules. That's, that, that's what I'm saying. The, the e even even the bright line rule is not very bright line, is it? Right. It's, it's not as easy as the judge would like it's not. it to be. No, this is an easy case, but the cases are not always that easy. All right, I got about two minutes left. That clock is slow, which is the thing I'll fix later. It's, 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 yeah, oh, yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that this is like in the first case that set up like cases for like oil companies and things like that. So is it true what like has to do with like natural resources? In Texas, right? Texas applies the rule of capture okay. to natural resources. That's the, the, the one second answer. Got All right. Uh, questions in general about law school. Forget this property stuff for a minute. Yes, yeah, so what's your name? Uh, Herschel. Herschel, yeah. So uh, does every professor provide their own exams? No. no. I do. Others don't. Um, it's, again, every, every professor has their own little enterprise, but all my old exams are available. And I don't know what my teaching schedule is for the fall, so I have no idea if you're in my class or not. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. They, I don't get my schedule until about June or so. That's when you'll get your schedule for next semester. You don't get to register. I mean, you register, but like you don't get to pick electives until basically your second year. Um, that's, that's generally how it works. Other questions? Yes? Did it mention that some professors are okay with like reporting them? You have to ask them. Yeah. If there's like a disability issue, sometimes they're more lenient, but um, uh, you have to ask. Yeah. Generally speaking, if we're assigned a case like this one, do we automatically assume that we should be writing a brief on it as well? Every case, okay. yeah. Um, and here's the rub. Your professor may assign four cases and cover three of them and not teach the fourth. The fourth is still in the exam. You're laughing. It's true. Um, I mean, you see the thicknesses of the books you just had to buy, right? It's not always possible to cover every uh, nook and cranny in class. And sometimes you spend an hour on one case, so you rush through the second case. Um, one, and I have to leave. Let me give one last parting thought. Uh, some professors give a very precise syllabuses. Others don't. Uh, mine is always, on this day, read these pages. I'm very uh, fastidious about that. Some professors say, just read 20 pages ahead of where we finish, which is very difficult. But that means you always have to be ahead. And you may not even know what, where you are, which means you have to read even further ahead. Uh, you can't be caught flat-footed. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am, what's your name? Liz. Liz, yeah. Um, how many professors expect you, or what are the odds that a professor expects you to bring the textbook into your class? Uh, <laughs> you should bring it. Um, I know they're heavy. Uh, most of your books have like online versions, which you can use also. Uh, but if laptops are banned, um, this won't help you now, but some of the case books come in loosely format. So you can actually like separate out the pages. Some students just literally s slice their book in a thing and put holes in them. Do that also. Uh, but if the book is heavy to carry, I know it's not super it's suitcases, right? The little things on wheels. A lot of students bring those and they bring them to class every day. But uh, if the teacher says turn to page 524 and you're like, I don't have my book, then you you're, you're didn't do what you're supposed to do. Um, I know, they're, they're heavy. And, and, and the binding suck. I, I, I publish a case book. I know this. The binding suck. Right? And they're going to rip apart because you're always throwing your locker back and forth in your trunk. The bindings actually rip, so just you have to take care of them. The online version is up. Yes, yeah, so what's your name? Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just really quickly, you know those um, e readers that have like the e ink? Yes. You, know, you can download books to them, but they're not for anything else. I was wondering if Kevin could check and what he would uh, Look, if a professor says no screens, that means no screens. Oh. Um, and that means also no phones. Don't, don't be on your phones. I, I know on your phones because you're looking at your lap. No one looks at their lap. There's no reason to look at your lap. I know what you're doing. You're not. You're not smart. You're not. I, I do it myself, right? You're not smarting me. Uh, but but try to turn your phones off for class. Um, I know people have like group chats and stuff in class. I I, I, mean, I don't care in my class if you're using your phone. I, I don't care as long as you're prepared. If I call on you, you're not prepared. I'll I'll, I'll get mad. But but um, uh, you have to be prepared. What else? Here's your free shot. Whatever questions are in your mind. Oh, good. Uh, I didn't like torts. Uh, was, not, was not my. Was not. My, I'll tell you this. I got a C plus in torts. <gasps> it's true. I always tell this at orientation. I got a C plus in torts. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, <laughs> my first semester of law school, I didn't have any lawyers in my family. I did not know what I was doing. My first semester, I finished in the 15th percentile for law school. I finished top 10, so I had to work my butt off. But I didn't know what I was doing. I, I'll tell you this more. 
I didn't know what 1L meant. I'm serious. When I first came to law school, someone said, are you a 1L? I was like, I don't know what that even, what that even means. Let me do one more. Do you know in all the cases it lists the judge's name, like Tompkins, comma, J, Livingston, comma, J? For the first month of law school, I was like, wow, there are a lot of judges with the first name of J. That's the first initial. <laughs> you can laugh. But here I am now, right? Uh, you can improve, right? Your first semester, I'll be blunt. If you have lawyers in your family or if you have close friends who are lawyers, there's going to be a slight comparative advantage. That disappears after the first semester because you catch up and you can't, you can't rely on that. Um, but if you don't have any lawyers, I didn't, have, I didn't know lawyers, I didn't know what I was doing. If you don't know lawyers, you're going to have to hustle a little bit harder because you're not going to know what a good outline is until it's too late. Right? Until the professor calls you, he's like, oh, crap, I don't know the answer. Then he's like, oh, here's what I should have done. Right? You're not going to know how to write an exam unless you really work it. Uh, your professors will give you midterms. Um, take those seriously. Take those so seriously. Right? Don't blow them up. Go talk to professor because the midterm is a good predictor of the final exam. In my class, generally when people get in the midterm, that's their final exam score. There's very little movement. Occasionally someone goes up and then go down, but people usually are, whatever their midterm score is, that, that's where they wind up. Um, so take that seriously. Yes, Liz, is that? So I know that you don't observe, um, and I was wondering if you could talk about like the differences so between one person telling you, my brother's a lawyer, said that he hasn't heard them like quote the poem, but then I heard that you guys take the value that you promised. That's how curves work. So I, I, I generally, I don't mean this to you, Liz, but most people don't know how statistics work, right? Uh, all a curve means is that in a given class, I can only give so many A's, so many B's, so many C's, and so many D's, right? Um, to make this very easy, let's just say a B is a 3.0, right? Which I think uh, most of you will get B's, right? That's just the way things work. So if you get on my exam, let's say, I have 100 points somewhere in the 70s you're probably going to wind up with a B, right? That's not curving up or down. That's simply assigning a raw score to a, to, 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 to a letter value, right? Uh, professors have a range, right? Uh, the class average has to be between 2.85 and 3.15. So some professors give higher than 3, some professors give lower than 3. It's going to be depending on what you have. Um, the reason why you have a curve is not to punish or reward people. It's to standardize grades across the section, right? So let's say you have one section with a very generous grader and another section with a very strict grader, right? How do you even them out? How can you say these are the same students, the same school? The curve limits us. So you can't be too stingy. You can't be too generous, right? That's what a curve does. Uh, but really, don't worry about the curve. Every curve is natural, right? When I give an exam with about 50 of you here, I guess, I haven't counted it, but 50 of you here, <coughs> if I give an exam with 50 of you here, There'll be about seven or eight A's, 30-something uh, B's, maybe six or seven C's, and a couple D's. I don't have to know. That's what it will be. Uh, without fail, every year it's the same. It, 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 it balances out that pretty naturally. I don't have to do much to it. So the curve doesn't help or hurt you. It, it, it merely ensures Professor A and Professor B are giving roughly the same scores. So don't, don't worry about the curve too much. Just worry about your own grades um, and being at the top of the curve. But yeah, most people will get B's. That's just that's, that's how it works. Uh, yes, Chelsea. Do our midterms actually have any effect on that? <sighs> this is an important question. Under the current, um, by the way, what time do you have lunch? I don't want to keep you. Okay, you keep going. Yes, yeah, fine. You guys can eat later. Under the current, <laughs> under the I'll say as long as you need. Under the current South Texas policies, one um, L midterms don't count towards your final grade. Your grade, ready for this? Your grade is one hundred percent of your final exam. So whatever you get in your final exam is your law school grade. If you do well in the final exam, hey. If you do bad, you're, that's not good. Um, I don't like that policy very much. I'm actually not a fan of it. I would like to count it maybe 10 or 15%, but I can't. But the rub, Chelsea, and this is why it's problematic, is when you tell students this won't count towards your final grade, they don't take it seriously. I know you all will. Don't disappoint me, right? I can't tell you how many people just walk into the law school midterm cold. They don't even study. They blow it. They waste their time. Um, you'll be tempted to do that. It's like, oh, it doesn't count. I have a legal writing memo. I have this. I have to do that. 
treat the midterm as if it's a final because your midterm grade will be your final. I can't, I, I don't want to make sugarcoat it. People don't move up or down very much. And act together halfway through the semester, you're probably not going to catch up. Right? With law school, once you fall behind, it's like this pit. And you're, you're climbing, 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 and you're not going to, you're not going to figure it out over Thanksgiving break. That's not going to happen. Or I guess in this case, Easter break, right? You're not going to figure it out over spring break. You're not going to put it together because you, you, there's too much to catch up on. But, but to answer your question, the midterms do not count, um, unfortunately. Uh, I think they should, and I complain about this every year. Uh, but you have to treat them as if they did count. And go meet with the professor. That's my hand somewhere there before. Yeah, what's your name? Uh, the term is uh, Aldo Luis. Aldo, yeah. But do his detours, the fastest way of getting in trouble, being having that little already paid code? Oh, the, 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 the commercial outlines, yeah. What happens if. Well, almost done. Yeah. What happened? You if you said you get in trouble really quickly. So if I see you reading from those in class, I won't be happy. So don't bring them to class. I mean, don't use them at all, but, but you're going to use them. Don't bring them to class. But just don't take shortcuts, right? Mm -hmm. You're not helping yourself. Because let me put it this way. You don't know if the person who prepared that outline is good, right? You don't know if the person who prepared that outline is highlighting stuff that your professor wants, right? They may take a 10-page case and reduce it to a paragraph, and they will exclude all the stuff your professor wants you to know. So you're screwed. So in other words, if you start giving stuff, let me, let me make this point differently, right? If, if you start giving stuff that's not in your book, the professor will know, like, where'd you get that from? Like, I know when someone's using outside sources, because they'll give me stuff that I didn't assign. It's like, where'd you get that from? Right? You pick it out quick. All right, other questions? Going once, going twice. I'll stay up here. They have lunch now, right? I'll stay up here for a few minutes. If you want to chat and come talk to me? But uh, I think uh, where do they have lunch now. Thank you all. Okay, thank you all, and I'll be here for a few minutes. If you want to talk?